Thanks everyone for coming. It's so great to see all the old friends and all the new friends and especially all the very cool things everyone's doing. Uh, I want to doubly thank Alex for scheduling a talk before mine that was so full of amazing graphics <laughs> that no one would possibly be able to bear any more <laughs> and I could, I could leave them out of my talk. Uh, so this is a design and practice, and the objective here is to demystify design somewhat. I think somewhat. I think I've given a few talks in the past that are about a lot of the ideas in design, but left uh, the concrete practice of it sort of underspecified, and it's led to maybe a certain uh, imagined uh, magicness to to design that I want to dispel. I think design is something that you can learn to do. I think it's something that has concrete activities, you know, practices or things that we do. Uh, oh, by the way, if you're playing word definition bingo, you're going to wish you had like more than one card today. Uh, and, uh, and to try to talk you through some of the, I, what I think are kind of lightweight things that we do actually really do uh, in trying to do design as a team on uh, closure and datomic as we work. So we're talking about concrete things. Another thing I want to do is talk about things that you can make into activities. I think a lot of people struggle when they say, well, we want to do more design in our shop, but we can never get it justified. You know, we're saying nebulous things like, I want to take two weeks off and think about the problem before we start. And even if you get that, you know, two weeks at the beginning isn't necessarily uh, what you're going to need. So one of the things that's good about reifying activities is that they can become things that go into your project management system as stories that you're going to do that will have outputs uh, the other thing I want to talk about today is progress. A lot of times people say, I know what design is. You know, I've seen you know, people doing planning sheets or diagrams or things like that, but I don't really have a sense of, you know, did I write the right diagram? Am I, am I accomplishing something? When we, when we make software, you know, we see it accrete, and we see it do more and more stuff every day. And when we design, you know, what does it mean to move forward? Do we know we're moving forward or just spinning around? So this isn't any kind of method, uh, you know, I don't want it to adopt that. I'm not trying to rain on, you know, proper methods and there are, there are plenty of really cool design methodologies out there. So, we all know, I'm just reminding you, Latin for design means not being allowed to code. Uh, and uh, I, I don't actually think that's true. In, in fact, I think that you know, as we'll see as we go through the talk, that you, you do coding throughout the design process, uh, not necessarily starting to write your system, but exploring what your system might become, uh, learning about the things that are gonna be parts of your system, answering questions and things like that. And it's one of the reasons why I think it's important to work in a language where that kind of work has zero project-y kind of overhead that you do not need to have, been, you know, have started your thing or be in a context, be in a project context uh, to start doing exploratory programming. You open up your editor and you go. Uh, no, so really design, right, the word means to mark out a plan for doing something, or at least the meaning that we're gonna use in this talk. Uh, I'm gonna expand that idea to be the entire step, set of steps that get you from uh, you know, a sense that something should happen in the world to the ability to mark out that plan, the marking out of the plan, and then hopefully the subsequent uh, development of it. And this marking out is something I think is gonna be super critical, but that we're gonna be writing all the time. We're gonna be writing, putting text in front of our faces and in front of the faces of our teammates so we can see what we're thinking about. And I think this is a, something that's very important for helping you think in the first place. This is not an archival activity. This is not about capturing things for posterity. It's not about creating documentation as you go or anything like that. This is about writing as part of thinking. Uh, putting something down on paper makes it a thing. It's something that you can then look at and now it becomes an input to you even though it started in your own head. Uh, it also helps you pick things up when you've left them around for a while or allows people to join you in your work. Uh, and then maybe eventually you'll turn it into something that you'll use to document what happened in the end. Uh, so we're going to be writing, we're going to be talking, but especially writing words down, hopefully, and we can write diagrams down too. 
And I think that choosing good words is super critical. It's something you should do all the time. And you know, I'm not talking about picking the right name for your product or anything like that or doing something that's about marketing. Uh, it's about choosing words that have the meaning that you intend and that help everybody come to a shared understanding of what you mean when you say something. Uh, you know, this idea of precision and cutting is going to come up all the time. That CIS part uh, is about cutting. And it's the same part of decide. Uh, so we, we need to be precise when we're saying things so we know what is the thing we're saying and what is not the thing we're saying. Uh, so I do not like nicknames, no superheroes or anything like that. You know, one, of the, one of the most horrifying things was arriving you know, at a, a project and finding you know, a diagram of the project that was you know, nickname in a box, nickname in a box, nickname in a box with unlabeled arrows. You know, pointing from one to the other. You're not, you're not helping anyone else and you're not helping yourself. These names are not semantic. And in particular, by not being a meaningful name, it means that it doesn't have to change when you change your mind. You just, I called it, you know, kryptonite or something, you know, the flash. And, you know, if, if I change what I'm doing, you know, it could still be called the flash. It'll be fine. So you want to use precise words. And the other thing you're going to need to be able to do often is say something rather involved in not much space. And I think that is another critical skill. You're going to see me say succinct over and over and over again in this talk. And it's important to sort of understand what it means, which I didn't know what it meant you know, from an etymology standpoint until I looked it up. And it means to gather up your like toga before battle, <laughs> uh, to gird or gather up. And the important thing is that what you're gathering up when you're trying to be succinct is the entirety of things. It's not about being concise. It's not about being, uh, you know, I've only got six words to say here, so I'm going to leave out the critical details because I need to get it done in six words. All right, so we're going to gather up our thoughts. The other thing is this dictionary thing. Um, you know, it's not just good for writing talks. Uh, it's good every day. We do actually use the dictionary while we work. We're, you know, we'll get to a point where we need to name something and we will take out the dictionary. Everybody's racing through the thesaurus and trying to find the right word and a good word. I can't you know, state how wonderful I think that is and I would encourage everybody to go do it, especially to get down to the origins where they break apart because the origins will always show you that most of the words that we use are composite and that that you know, prepositional prefix part is full of really interesting things, like is it towards something? Is it away from something? Is it moving stuff together? Is it cutting it apart? Uh, I think that doing this fires up the process of abstraction. You start thinking about things in, in, a, in a way that's not tied to the details, but more about uh, bigger ideas. The other advantage of using precise words is that uh, you could be looking at this word and trying to communicate something and it becomes evident that that word is the wrong word. It might have been a good word. And it might be that you know, perfectly, in a perfectly fine way, you've changed your mind. You've evolved your thinking. You got some new information and you're doing something different. But the great thing is if you've been using precise words, they will seem wrong and you can pause and pick a better word. Uh, all right, so we're going to have our first technique. The first technique is add a glossary to your set of stuff that you're building while you're working. Right? We're going to have all kinds of terms in technology. Uh, that's going to happen. It's amazing. Even amongst technologists, we'll say a word, and everybody in the room will have a different idea in their head, even though they've heard it and used it over and over and over again. Uh, so don't presume that everybody understands what you're saying. You want a place where you define things, one place where you define things. Uh, and then after you've defined it, you want to use it consistently. Don't use words to mean two different things. Don't be lax about that. This is hard to do, I think, in general. So it's an objective. We, no one does it perfectly. Uh, this is stuff to aspire to. Uh, and then you know, the other thing is, if something breaks, fix it or drop it. So this is you know, some, of these, some of these artifacts and some of these techniques are things that you know, they're ephemeral. You're going to do them, and, and you're going to move on. But this is one that you have to maintain. Uh, so this is an example of glossary. You probably can't see that. I think I worked out how I could make you be able to see a little more. But this is real. This is a real one. 
talking about a feature, we have a bunch of very specific words that we're using to talk about uh, locality, affinity, and partitions, and datomic, and so this is a thing that we have and that we've maintained through a project that you know, lasted eight months or so. Uh, so I encourage you to do this. All right, so the other thing we're gonna be doing as part of uh, an overarching sense of, uh, of skills is asking questions. Uh, this is a very powerful tool, asking questions, and it's an old tool. And one of the beautiful things about asking a question and formulating a question is you've made clear that you're looking for something, that there is a thing that you want. And, and I think that we state things all the time. And when you state things, your intentions are not evident. Uh, when you ask things, not only do you want to try to get an answer, but what you need becomes evident. Uh, so I think get, asking good questions is a skill. It's another one of these things that, you know, if you do it more often, you'll get better at it. The other thing I think is an aspect of questions is that they're provocative. You know, they poke you. And of course, when you ask a question of someone else, they feel like they've been poked. Uh, so you have to get good at asking and being asked and being comfortable with the, the questioning process as something uh, that's a positive thing. Uh, logic is an important part of making decisions and solving problems, but it's mostly a negative thing. I mean, we use logic to say, nah, this doesn't hold. This is inconsistent. If this is true, that can't be true. Uh, it's mostly a way we use to rule things out. So another technique I recommend is to discover, read about, and utilize the Socratic method. This is a proper thing with a lot of uh, history behind it, obviously, and um, some good organized descriptions. It is an activity you do together. Uh, it's not like a leader, you know, torturing people with questions, although my teammates will disagree with that statement. Uh, but but it, it means to sort of work together on trying to find the truth by asking and answering questions, by taking an answer to a question and exposing that answer to further examination eventually trying to get to the truth. And I talked before about questions being provocative, and, you know, and it's supposed to be a dispassionate examination of, of ideas, and that means not suffering, and I think that it's a big challenge as you try to do Socratic method with teams. This is not common, and I think socially, this kind of dialogue has fallen away, and its use as a skilled practice amongst people who are cooperating uh, has fallen away, so it just seems like a form of argument or, or attack or hostility or something like that. That's not what it is. Uh, so uh, one of the things I recommend is you try to you know, detach yourself from your, your own ideas. Even when you do this by yourself, you should be able, you should be thinking about your ideas as things you're gonna pose and shoot down. And do that over and over and over again. And not get attached to your ideas, not co-identify with your ideas. And the whole idea here is that there is some objective truth and we're trying to find out what it is. We're not inventing it. It's not coming out of our heads. We're discovering it. Uh, if you wanna learn more about the Socratic Method, I recommend this book. Uh, it's really fantastic. There's a bunch of history. Maybe at the beginning you would skip uh, but I think it's great. So, some of the, uh, <laughs> the, the biggest Socratic wizards in the universe are the Jesuits, and uh, I, I was lucky enough to study with the Jesuits back in high school, and my homeroom teacher was Father Watson, a Jesuit, and he would always be asking us these four questions. And he would ask us these questions in physics class and in algebra class, uh, as a way to you know, do the work, do the problem, right? This stuff makes sense when you're looking at a problem. What, what have you got? I've got X and Y, I know Y, and I'm trying to find X and the stuff's over here. Where are you going? I'm gonna try to you know, discover what X is. You know, I know X, I need to know Y. What are you gonna do? I'm gonna try to isolate Y by moving stuff over to the other side. And that was all fine. But he also asked us these questions in homeroom, you know, as life questions. Where are you at? Where are you going? What do you know? What do you need to know? And I think that you know, as developers, this where you're at, where you're going, this is what we do. We're good at this, right? This is, you know, stand up. What'd you make yesterday? I made a bread box. What are you making today? I'm making a toaster. You know, and then checking stuff off, and you're busy doing things. 
but you're not often talking about why you're doing the things. And the important part of these latter two questions is that you're, you're now talking about uh, why you're doing things from the perspective of moving your knowledge forward. So we're gonna break down these four questions into uh, two axes and two stages. One is the understanding <laughs> axis, right? What's happening to our understanding? How is our understanding moving forward? Right? We understood this much, now we're gonna understand some more. I talked about when we're deving, we know what, when we're getting progress because we're accreting more code and maybe more features and the software can do more things. When we're designing, where, what are we accreting? I'm gonna say one way to think about design is that you're accreting understanding. You're expanding your understanding that you're, what the driver for activity should be expanding your understanding. And you're gonna take the two questions in each thing and you say one is a status question, right? What do, we, what do we know right now? What have we got in hand for both axes? And then the other is, what do we want to do next? And we're going to drive what we do next, that activity side, from what we want to know next, what we want to understand next. And I think what's cool about this is that this framing, I mean, Father Watson asks us these questions all the time, over and over and over again. This is a frame you can take out on any day and say, where am I at? What do I know? What do I need to know? What do I want to do about it? And as we talk about the different phases of design, we'll talk about the fact that this framing can be used over and over. The other thing I want to talk about here just briefly is look at how this is reflective. You're thinking about your thinking. This is super important. Being aware of what you're thinking about helps you think. It also helps agendaize your background thinking. So that's where it becomes reflective. So we're going to call this reflective inquiry. I just want to talk a little briefly here before we dig into the steps that uh, I'll be talking about contributing to this top ticket. One of the challenges I find people have is they have these project management systems and they're like, we're going to make a thing. And they start writing tickets. And it's like, you have no idea what you're doing yet. How could you write a ticket? And how could you even know what your tickets are supposed to be? And you need to have a ticket for what your tickets are going to be. You need to have a ticket that says this is what the overarching uh, plan is, and the thing is, that ticket, it's neither the first ticket, nor is it the last ticket. It's sort of an early ticket, the top story that says, with a good understanding of what's going on, this is our agenda. Before that ticket, though, you should be doing some design work, right, that contributes to, to the initial story, to saying, we have a mission, we understand a problem, we're going to take it on, we're this is the approach we're going to take, and this is how we're going to do it. I think all stories should have these four sections. I'll talk more in detail about them in a second. A title, a description of the situation, a problem statement, which we'll talk about more, and then eventually, after you've done some design, the approach you're going to take to doing it. So when I talk about stories contributing to the top story, I'm talking about early design stories. Right? We said we want to agendaize design activity. Right, we're going to have early stories that are about doing design, they're going to contribute to a top story, which will be sort of your lead story to move forward. All right, so this is an example story. This is not an example top story. This is just an example of a story with a decent shape, right? There's this uh, thing people are talking about. I wish I could use closure, you know, Java streams and closure seek functions. The description, which is about the situation in the world without necessarily talking about what's wrong. The problem, which is talking about what the challenge or obstacle is to that. And then the approach. This talk is going to dig into the details of all these things. But that's what a story is. And the top story will look like this, but it will be about the overarching uh, objective. All right, so I sort of talked about this already. Design progress, we're going to do, we're going to measure in terms of increasing our understanding and tracking the decisions we made, but importantly, why. Uh, it, what's important is that this is not uh, a checklist kind of thing. I'm not going to say that any of the activities I'm enumerating are necessary or that you should put them in a list when you get home and then say, we're going to do rich hickey design by checking off these things. That is not it. Right? You're going to do whatever of these things makes sense in order to move your own understanding forward. So I do think that this moving forward, this linearity of design is a real thing. Uh, you know, there's this is tremendous pushback, or there was a tremendous pushback against waterfall development, this idea that you, know, you analyze, you design, you spec, you code the thing, and then you deliver, 
And isn't that horrible? You know, isn't that awful? And it was, it was awful because I think there were uh, organizational structures put in place that had, you know, one person doing this part and then dumping on the next person who did this part and then dumped on the next person and somebody handed this thing. I was like, do you realize all these things about what you did were not right? Uh, but we've replaced that, we've replaced that with uh, a non-idea, which is this idea of iterative programming. And this Latin for do-over is not a joke. That's what iterative means, do-over. And I don't think do-over programming is a thing. I don't think that's a way to make anything that's really good. Uh, incremental is probably a better word. So we're going to try to move forward and increase our understanding. It is not monotonic. We will think something is a good idea. We will learn some more stuff, and we will say, nope, that wasn't a good idea, and we'll, we'll try another route up. But the, uh, the cool thing about the word phase is that it means appearance, like phases of the moon. Like so, you, you did something, and then you saw the next thing. You saw the next step. It's not like you, know, you pl programmed it into your nav, and it said, here's everything that's going to happen in your future. There's no nav uh, for software development. So it's OK. It's not monotonic. You want to stay open-minded. You will backtrack. The one thing I will say is, if you're backtracking, say so. So like say, look, we thought we had a, an approach that worked. We started to look at some of the implementation details. We found another problem, or we found that we didn't really understand the problem, or we can't do what we intended. And now we are going back to a prior phase where we're going to try to find a different approach because there were obstacles in our way. Uh, so extra points for the King Crimson reference. Uh, did anybody get the King Crimson reference? All right. One more. That was a low, that was a low probability. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, so I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna break these down now because this talk breaks down all these things. Describing, diagnosing, delimiting the problem, choosing a direction at a high level, choosing particulars at, as implementation details, and then doing it. Uh, the one thing is that I do think that these are phases that kind of lead into one another, but on an overarching level, there will always be the potential to do deciding. And, and in this case, when I'm saying deciding, I'm talking about scoping. Right? You may encounter a problem and you've required some level of understanding of it and said, we're not doing anything about that. Or you've you know, gone through and seen what the various approaches are and found that no approach will cover more than 80% of the problem. And you're going to say, that other 20% we're not going to do. Or somebody's going to tell you there's no money for your project. <laughs> and you'll say, all right, well, that's that. Uh, so this deciding doesn't have a spot uh, in, the, in the order. You need you're going to be ready to make decisions, hopefully, at any time. So describing literally just means to write things down. And the very first phase of design is just to write down what you're hearing. right? Users are complaining about whatever. People in Slack want X. Everybody says closure sucks because blah. You know, Whatever it is, you're, you're hearing things, and you just want to capture that. Maybe you've seen failures in a system, right? Maybe what the thing that you're trying to take on now has to do with a bug. So you have bug reports, or you have exception stack traces, or you have logs from uh, production systems. It doesn't matter. What you're going to be doing here is just writing it all down, maybe having more logs gathered, maybe having more conversations to people, right? With people uh, to, get, to get the information. So what do you know? Something seems wrong with the world. Right? What do you need to know? You need to know like, what, how, well, how big a problem is that? Where is it? What are its impacts? Things like that. What you're doing, you're observing and you're listening. And where are you going? You're trying to produce two things out of this. An initial story, that top story, the title for that, and also the description paragraph for that. So description paragraph. It should just be a paragraph. It should be the situation you find yourself in, the symptoms or those problem reports, all those things. You just want to capture the high level view of what they are. You can point to the details. The very important thing about this is that you're not saying right now what the problem is, right? This is, I have a headache. You're not saying, you know, because I have a brain tumor, because you could have a brain tumor or you could have not had enough water today, or your eyeglass prescription could be wrong, right? That's not what you're saying. You're talking. You're saying, patient has a headache. Uh, so you just don't say what the problem is. You say 
what the symptoms are, what the complaints are, and things like that. If somebody has a complaint that seems to incorporate the problem, do not accept that as a fact, right? Just say, somebody said they think this is the problem. Okay, and we're gonna write that down in our top story. The next phase is to diagnose the problem, and diagnose is an, another great word. Uh, it's not Latin, it's Greek, and it means to know across. That across is the dia part, like diagonal or diameter, same, same root, gnosis is to know. Uh, I was, again, I, I just looked it up, and it was super cool that this is what it meant. Uh, because I do think that this is a crossing. This is a movement from one possible set of knowing to another set of knowing. Uh, and there's two kinds of problems. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that we're, you know, we're talking about design for both of these. One kind of problem though is like your thing is broken and you're trying to fix it. Another kind of problem uh, is that people want a feature or you want a feature or somebody talked about some feature or, uh, and hopefully that feature is about a problem. So you need to go from the feature to the problem. So what do you know? You know the symptoms and the context, that's what you just did. Uh, what do you need to know? You need to know the cause. So now we're going to go and say, all right, well, you have a headache. Here's five, five reasons why, you, you know, you might have a headache. So you have a good description. That's what you did before. And you have the evidence that you collected before. And where you're going is you're going to try to uh, figure out what the problem is. So I'll take these in two different parts. Diagnosing bugs is a knowing across from a symptom to maybe multiple possible problems, and finally down to you know, what's, actually, what's actually wrong. It's your eyeglass prescription is off. You need, you need better glasses. That's why you're getting headaches all the time. Uh, so you'll have, hopefully, more than one hypothesis. This more than one, it's going to come up all the time. Design is not you know, thinking of one thing and then writing it out. That's not designing. That is, designing is about thinking of more than one thing. It's like the first skill you should have is, if you think it's one thing, just think of a second thing. Think of a second possible reason. If you're on a team, have everybody try to think of a reason. Of course, if you're playing that game, you don't want to go last. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, And then you're going to need to address them. And the one thing I would say here is that address them one at a time. In other words, explore these things one at a time. People will get a bunch of ideas about what's wrong, and they're like, I think you know the system's falling down. We're getting this exception. I think it's either uh, you know we have a bug in our code. Or there's a bug in the library code. There's a bug in the JVM. Solar flares, you know, uh, and and then they'll be in the code or running something like looking for all these possible things. You, know, you just don't do that. You need to pick one. Now logic helps you here, right? Sometimes you can look at the possibilities and say, you know, it can't be that. You don't wear glasses. <laughs> so although maybe you should. Uh, so we can use logic to rule stuff out. And then there's a bunch of things. I'm not really going to dig into any of these too deeply because every one of them would take an hour. Uh, but you'll have the thing that may be most likely either due to your intuition or it's the thing for which you have the most evidence. It seems like this. All the evidence seems to be pointing at that from our intuition standpoint. Uh, I think one of the most powerful tools you have here is to make the problem space smaller. Like if one of your hypotheses makes the problem space smaller, that's often a good thing to explore early. I'm often telling programmers you know, uh, that I work with, get that into a smaller context. Right? You see a problem in your system. Well, your production system is this big, hairy monster. You know, can you reproduce this problem with just this tiny piece of code? Can you reproduce it not using your code at all? You know, if you think it might be a library, you think it might just be an algorithmic you know, snafu, can you just write a little piece of closure code on the side and, and, and reproduce it there? And a great technique here is the scientific method. Stu's given a good talk about this, and I'm not going to do that here. But for each hypothesis you take on, you know, formulate a conjecture that you're going to try to prove or disprove. You're going to design an experiment, which is going to be some code you get to write. Uh, the one tip I would give you here is that frequently people will say, I'm trying to figure out this thing. And then they'll go and run some tests. And then they'll you know, need to summarize what they ran. And then you'll look at the summary and be like, I don't think you've got any information that helps us prove or disprove this conjecture. So the tip I would give you is that if you're going to go and run an experiment, the very next thing you should do before you write the code that tests the experiment is to write this spreadsheet or the template that says, 
this is the, what, how we're going to display the results. This is where we're going to put the results. We're going to have a column for this, a column for that, and rows for these things. And you want to look at that template and say, yeah, you know what? If we filled this out, we would know everything we need to know to do this conjecture. And then write a program that can provide the values for that template. Don't exploratory code and then wonder why you didn't get uh, the answers that you need to do it. OK, much trickier and much more common and much, much more commonly needed and much less frequently exercised is the knowing across from a feature request to the actual problem. right? So people ask for features all the time. I wish you, know, you had this. I wish you had that. You do also, right? You have your own internal feature requests, your backlog, and things you thought might be good features. Uh, we don't have feature X is never a valid problem statement. right? If you need proof of this, you only need to look at a modern car, you know, which has a touch screen, you know, where no one said, you know, I need to slide my finger on some random piece of glass to a precise point to set my blower in my car while I'm driving, right? <laughs> no one has ever said that, right? But somebody did say, we need touchscreens because, you know, young people will never buy our cars, right? This is what happens when you're not talking about the problem. So we're trying to get from a feature request, from a feature request to a problem for which that feature is one possible answer. So there's two things that happened here that were magical. One was you went from feature to problem. The other is you went from one answer to maybe an open set of answers. That's where you get the flexibility to do design. If somebody's just going to cram down, you know, it's time to make the toaster, uh, well, you may not be solving a problem. Right? So here are the exercises to say, take the feature request or your own feature idea and say, what, were your, what is your intention here? And then what's in your way? OK, so now you've got these feature requests uh, turned into problems. And you have just one more step, I think, before you have a problem statement, which is to try to delimit it. Right? As you've done this thing, you may have a notion of the problem. You may have com had conversations about the problem. Delimiting the problem is really just a matter of saying, what is the short, concise, precise way we're going to talk about the problem that we're going to take on making software to solve? Right, so you know what the problem is. You sort of did that in the diagnosis thing. All you're trying to do now is state it succinctly and give it some scope. All right, so a problem statement is a succinct statement of unmet objectives. Right, we're talking about what is the user's intention right, and the cause. It is not the symptoms anymore. We did that in the, in the describe phase. And it's not the remedy. We're still, that's still in front of us, what to do about it. Right? So, that if that still exists, if any sort of what we're going to do about it is still present here, you want to get rid of that. Right? At, the, at the point you've got a problem statement, you're going to be able to do two things with your top story. You're going to be able to modify. The initial story title was probably something like, I think a toaster might be a good idea. Uh, and now it is, you know, the user likes caramelized bread. Uh, and there's maybe more than one way to deliver that. Uh, so you're going to modify the title of your, your top story here to try to make it about the problem. Right? We've given somebody a way to accomplish X. It's the objective now. That's the name of your story. This is great. When you work in a project management system that isn't like build toaster, build bread box, build whatever, but it's like solve this problem, solve that solve problem, solve that problem, and you look at like what you've done, that latter list is way more satisfying than the one that's just feature, 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 feature. Uh, so and the other thing you're going to do is you're going to now add another thing to that top story. You had the title, description. Now you're going to have that problem s statement. Right? This is not forever and ever and ever. You're going to refine this. You may have gotten it wrong. You may have uh, you know, missed a subtlety you'll discover later. Uh, so this is another thing that needs maintenance. But it's also, it should be short. It should be a paragraph. Uh, that says what the problem is. This is super important. If you do not have this and if you do not relentlessly focus on it, you run, I think, a very high risk of asking somebody to slide their finger around on a touchscreen while they're driving in order to turn up the radio. <laughs> All right. So now I'm going to talk about two things of sort of direction and, and uh, uh, like strategy and tactics. And I, I, I'm not trying to imply that you will always have this 
differentiation or your thing will be layered like this. But uh, certainly, if it's a bigger thing, you will likely have two phases here. You'll have a direction setting moment, and then you'll have many implementation decision moments where you're going to be doing similar things just at a different level, about a different level of detail. So at the direction stage, it's about strategy, right? Strategy means to be a general or to lead. And fundamentally, it means about where are you going, right? We're all going to follow you that way. Uh, the things you want to capture here is you want to capture those intentions and objectives of the user, not how, but what they're trying to do. And you're then going to start thinking about what are the ways that you could possibly address, address it. We're going to call them approaches. And these are high level. I'm, I'm not trying to enumerate them all here. Uh, but a very basic one would, for instance, be are we going to try to provide an automated solution to m make this happen for the user? Or are we going to provide a tool for the user to you know, do it for themselves? That's a kind of directional decision that you want to you make. So you know what the problem is. What do you need to know? You need to know about the user objectives in more detail. You're going to dig down a level on the user objectives. You're going to enumerate a bunch of possible approaches. You're going to try to decide which one is best. So this is a big, this is a big phase. Uh, and along the way, you're going to have to have reflected about what matters to you in making this decision. Right? And then what are you going to do about it? Here you're going to you know, you've already got the description of the problem statement. You're going to want to walk out of this phase with enumerated use cases. You want to walk out of this phase which, with what I'll call a strategy decision matrix. I'll show you that in a second. But it incorporates the criteria for deciding the approaches you might take and the trade-offs of each. You'll also be doing the high-level scoping thing, which could include we're not taking this on right now, but it may include we're not going to provide an automated solution because that's going to be too big. We already have that sense, uh, but we may provide a tool for the users to help themselves do this thing. And eventually, you're going to get something to write in your top story that is the approach you're taking. So use cases. I think everybody thinks they know how to do use cases. Um, and that's usually not what I want to see in a use case, because I think, again, there's two phases. The best first phase for use cases is to talk about only what people intend to accomplish. What, what they'd like to be different about the world, what they wish they could do, not how, right? So you're going to make a little tiny sheet that says intention, intention, intention. That's got a how column that's, that's blank. I don't believe in this, you know, make a card that says the user should put a push a button and it's going to be this color and it will do this thing. I mean, if you want to do that, that's great. Uh, that's not what this talk is about. Uh, later, You'll have a strategy that you've chosen, and you'll go back. Actually, you'll know a little bit more about how you're going to implement it. And you'll go back and say, you know what we're actually going to do? We're going to give the user a friggin' knob for the uh, volume, please. All right. So here we go. So this is what a template for a use case should be. It's not very sophisticated, right? But always put your problem in A1. Right? Just remind yourselves, this is what we're thinking about. Right? If you leave that off, I don't, know what, I don't know what this sheet is about. You're going to fill in column A. Objective, 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 right? I wish the radio was louder. I wish I could make the radio louder. I wish I could turn it off. I wish I could mute it while my phone call came in. Not how. These are just things I'd like to be able to do. And then how you do later. All right, so this is real. Again, we really do this. Everybody heard about Morse today? Maybe, Rebel's successor? Right, so there's a lot of things you could do with Morse, a lot of contexts in which you could use Morse, and a lot of ways you might want to connect Morse to your stuff. And we were just sort of brainstorming. And this is not a giant thing. This was, you know, we sat and talked for 40 minutes, and this is what we did while we were talking. We made this sheet, we filled it out, and uh, we talked about uh, what was what. But in, the, in this use case phase, we'd only do A. Right? This is a completed story that uh, shows B, column B, the how as well. Uh, right. All right. So the other big technique in this phase is the decision matrix. And this is the heart of the talk, is to talk about decision matrix. I used to do this when I was mostly designing by myself in org mode, but I am a complete convert that the best way to do this kind of design in this phase of design and this, this work is in a spreadsheet. 
And in particular, it's in a spreadsheet that's a live editing spreadsheet. So we use Google Sheets for this thing. Right, so what is a decision matrix? It's a spreadsheet. It's a spreadsheet that more than one person can see at the same time and edit at the same time. I don't know if somebody else, I'm sure Microsoft has one. Uh, A1 will be what, what decision are you trying to make? What problem are you working on? Always A1. If I come up to your project and you want some design mentoring and A1 is not filled in, guess what we're gonna be working on? A1. Have a good problem statement. You can copy your problem statement you know, right in here. Often though, this is more of a specific decision, uh, but it should be related to that. Keeping your problem in your face is super important. It should just be always like, this problem is just haunting me. Uh, and I'm seeing it, which means I'm forced to think about it as an external stimulus. That's also critical. All right, so what are you gonna have? You're gonna have different approaches to solving the problem. These will be your columns. Uh, the first of the columns will label the rows, but the other columns will be your, your various possible approaches. You'll have criteria, right? How are you gonna make this decision? These will be the rows, right? Except the very first row or two labels the columns. And finally, you have the interior cells, which is the aspects of a particular approach from the perspective of that criteria. That's what goes in the inner cell. I do strongly recommend sheets over docs here. Docs are linear and they do not support contrast, which I'll talk about in a second. So this is a template for a DM. I don't think I have to zoom this one in, right? This is, this is not real. This is just a template. The upper left corner, A1, what problem are you working on? B, C, D, E are the current, are the approaches you want to take. If you have, uh, if you're modifying a system that already kind of does this or has a lacking in this area, make that the first approach, right? And the first approach is do nothing. Like, where are we at? What does our system do right now? Usually, there'll be something not great in that column. Uh, and then you'll have other approaches. I'll talk in detail about that in a second, right? And then down, the rows are criterion, criterion, criterion. And then inside, we have the aspects where we're going to talk about how the approach deals with the criterion. So the approaches, we're going to label them in the top. Again, you need to be succinct, but don't take goofy names. Don't do super shorthands. If somebody walked up to your thing and they read just the first box of column C, would they understand what column C was really about? Or did you shorthand the meaning of it away? Uh, if, you, if you can't get it done in something that's more like a title, like in row one, take a second row and put in you know, a sentence length thing. You need for what you're talking about to be super clear. I've seen a lot of people just struggle here because they have columns and it's not actually clear what this column is about, what strategy or what approach this is about. Put enough detail in there so you can distinguish the two. And then freeze those rows. I already talked about using the first uh, column, uh, first approach to be like what you do right now. Uh, you want to think about what other people do, right? This is stuff from hammock driven development. And then you're going to have your own first ideas about you know, possibly good approaches. The main thing I want to do here is this is not, a, it's emphasize, this is not a shopping exercise. This is not just like, well, I've got what we do, what other people do, and my first idea, and let's, we're going to pick one. That is not what it's about. It's about going through the exercise of examining how they differ from each other, what their qualities are, and hopefully driving the birth of one or more new columns, new approaches. This is a place where you can innovate. Uh, so it's not, it's not shopping. All right, criteria. This word is very important. It's not characteristic. It's criteria. Criteria, it's a means of judging, deciding, critic, critical. All those words are about making a decision and about saying positive and negative things about things so that you can judge. Um, but what is the basis for that judgment? Well, that's, that's something that's got to be reflective, right? It's not in the problem. It's in how you feel about addressing the problem. I mean, that some of it is driven by the problem, right? If, you're, if, you're, if your approach doesn't solve the problem at all, if it doesn't make the headache go away, well, it's not really an approach to getting rid of somebody's headache. Uh, so you will have some rows for solving the problem, but you'll have a bunch of other rows potentially that are about meta characteristics of this approach. How much development time does it take? Is it compatible with what we've done before? Is it gonna possibly break things, right? Uh, how much does it cost? How much will it cost to operate? 
Is it allowed by, you know, some regulatory thing? Uh, you're going to have a bunch of things that are candidates for rows, but you should never, like, fully enumerate them in advance. Every time you take on a problem, you're going to need to be selective about what matters and only put in what matters, right? So you want things that are salient or relevant. Salient means it's an aspect of this thing that sticks out, right? And relevant means that it's an aspect of this thing that matters to our problem, right? If you have, uh, you know, one of your columns is, you know, a live bunny, and another one of your columns is a tank in a bunny suit, right? You're not going to have a row that's like, well, what color is the fur? Or like, how soft is it? Right? You're gonna have a row that says like, how much lettuce does it eat? And you're like, can it crush a truck? And what kind of ammunition does it need? Right? The things that really distinguish these two things that like say, well, you know, maybe we don't want to, I don't know, how much does the tank weigh? We don't want a really, really heavy bunny. Uh, all right, so it's not characteristics, it's criteria. And then we're gonna have the aspects. This is a, again, succinct description that goes in the inner cell. Uh, I, you really want to write some words here. You really want to help people understand when this approach, you know, when you think about this approach from this perspective, or when you look at this approach from the perspective of, that, of this criteria, that's what aspect means, to look at something. When you look at it from that, this is what you see. It should be like, a, it should be words here, not mostly, not yes, no, true, false, that kind of stuff. Try to say, you know, if it, if, it, if it does it, say how it does it, not that yes, it does it. Say how it does it, because you're going to have two different answers that both have a yes, but how they do it differs. Write down how they're doing it, not just yes, they do it. Yes, they have it. They have, you know, do they have a backup strategy? Yes, yes. Well, you know, one may use floppy disks and one may use replication. So say that. Uh, the other thing you want to do here is you want to avoid subjective judgment in your text. Don't do that, right? Just write what the facts are. When we look at this from this perspective, this is what it has, or maybe it doesn't have this, right? And then what I'd advocate and what we do is we use colors, right, which you saw before some colors on the sheet, to show subjectivity. This is the only place that we use subjectivity on the sheet, right? If something is just okay for this, we leave it neutral, clear. If there's some challenge or negative characteristic uh, to the way that this uh, approach deals with this uh, criterion, then we'll color it yellow. If the way it does it seems completely blocking, it's just prohibitive to us, prohibitive to the user, failing to answer the problem, we'll color it red, so it's kind of blocking. Um, and if it's particularly uh, nice, uh, desirable, or better than the others, we'll color it green. Uh, you can, as a shorthand, just start with pros and cons rows, right? Here's my approaches, here's the pros of this, and here's the cons of this. But the thing is, maybe you're picking between you know, two libraries, and uh, you know, one of the libraries says, I have really low latency, and the other one says, I really have high throughput. Right? And these are their features. Well, okay, that's two pros, but you haven't looked at the high throughput one on the basis of what is its latency, and you haven't looked at the low latency one from the perspective of you know, how is its throughput. So until you've broken up these things so that every criterion gets its own row, you're not gonna have the ability to contrast, right? What we're trying to do is to get things next to each other that are different, right? That's what makes our mind go. We love edges, we love seeing edges. You need to create edges in your ideas. That's what's gonna trigger your thinking. All right, this is a real DM here. Uh, Right? We're trying to think about, we are thinking about, this is not something we're shipping yet. Uh, how do we deal with functional interfaces in Clojure? There's a lot of ways to do it. There's, you know, this sheet goes, goes over there. Uh, but you know, there's a concise problem statement in A1. You can't use Java methods to take Java functional interfaces without using an adapter or reify, reify today. Column B is what we have today. Right? People are writing reify a lot. They need to know the types that they're trying to target. It's a lot of redundant stuff. That column is kind of a lot of orange, which is between yellow and red, and yellow. Uh, so, and then there are other approaches which are good. Uh, it's rare that something is totally amazing. All right, so some tips about doing a good DM. Avoid the all green column. That's very unlikely. That's a sign you might be rationalizing. Right? Nothing is like totally wonderful. 
Uh, avoid undistinguished columns. If you go through and there's two columns and they're not different in any way, you're probably missing a row. You're probably missing some criteria that distinguishes them and you want to find it. Right? I talked before, you don't want an exhaustive row set. Right? You don't want a predefined row set and you don't want like every characteristic of every possible uh, approach. You just want the ones that matter and relentlessly move up. Right? The other nice thing about a spreadsheet is you can move rows up. You just drag them and they go up. So keep pushing up on your spreadsheet on the things that most distinguish your different approaches. No one cares about pages and pages of like everything's the same on this, on this, from this perspective. Right? Avoid links or kind of references out as your primary cell content. Write something there. The key here from a thinking standpoint is you are seeing the stuff that matters. If it's a link, you're seeing nothing. You've got to go break your concentration and go follow the link down. You can have links as supplements. Don't use the features of these things that allow, you know, like comments. I see like a little, you know, triangle in the corner. Like, what is that? I got to hover or click and now it's over here. If you have a question about something or you think it's bad or whatever, you know, just write it. You know, on the cell next to it or in the notes, you'll see a lot of these things have notes columns. Just write it in the notes. So it's in someone's face. Now they don't have to opt into seeing what you think. You said what you think and you put it in their way. Uh, and then avoid phrasing the criteria as questions. This is because you want to be able to write questions in your sheet, and you want to be able to search for them. Right? As you were going, you were like, I wonder if this can do this. I wonder if this will be fast enough. I wonder if we should be thinking about this thing. Uh, if, you, if you phrase your criteria as, does it have this question mark? Does it have that question mark? Then you can't search for question mark and find your questions. All right, so what do you get when you do this? You're going to have a good description of the problem. You're going to have a bunch of approaches with good descriptions of those. You'll have made decisions about what matters. You'll have done that, that introspection, right? So it's reflective. You'll have details about how everything approaches it. And you'll have an at-a-glance subjective assessment. So I can quickly, if I'm coming into your thing and you've done this, I can quickly see what you think is good or bad or what you're trying where you think the trade-offs lie, and all the su subjectivity is in one dimension. Right? If I don't agree with you, I can take your sheet, dupe it, and change all the colors to blank, and I will be dealing with something with no subjectivity left. All right, so what, what are the benefits of having done this? Well, certainly, you get to come back later and resume your work. Somebody else can join you in the thought process and arrive late and catch up. While more than one person is working on this, you all can be looking at the sheet. This is so much better than just gabbing on Zoom and having everybody take independent notes and then maybe trying to reconcile those notes. We always make a sheet and stick it in our face and type into it while we're talking. Uh, and it means that you're going to have shared understanding. You're going to be able to say, I don't think you're saying that right. I don't think that, you know, that is the case. That's good. That's the Socratic method saying, you know, questioning. Um, is that really true? The other thing I think happens as you've done this sort of cutting up and, and pick the criteria is you're starting to do abstraction. You're starting to see, well, I had five possible choices, but only two ways to do this. Right? You're learning the physics of the problem. There's only two ways to do this. There's only one way to do that. Everybody does it the same way. Maybe there should be another way. You could ask the question, and you're finding characteristics that maybe you want to lift later as abstraction. And then this is the kind of thing, if you do this during the day, I promise you, you're going to get new ideas when you hit the hammock or the bed. All right, and then the next phase of design, it, uh, it, next phase of design is design. And I purposely made design a phase of design because this design is about mark out a plan for doing it. Right? This is the actual traditional notion of design. But I put it in the context of what is design because you actually cannot start here. You can't just say, I'm doing design. This is the first thing I'm going to do. I'm going to start thinking about how. I'm going to make something. You see now, you, you will have skipped over all this other stuff that's valuable. So, uh, so now you'll actually be down to, all right, we have an approach we've chosen to take. Uh, we think it's the eyeglass thing. Now we're going to go and try to figure out how to make it, or maybe we've figured out we're going to want a knob, and we have to figure out where to put it, and should it be grippy or should it be slidey? Hint, it should be grippy. Should it be detented or not? Yes, it should be detented. You know, this kind of stuff. Uh, all right, so what do we know? We know the problem and the direction already. And you see this, you're gaining power, you're gaining velocity, you're gaining confidence, right? 
you know the direction you're going to take. What do you need to know? Well, you, you've got uh, maybe a, a, an approach you're going to take, but not exactly how you're going to implement it. Right now is where you'd be talking about, like, what's the API going to look like? We've decided to make an API. We've decided to make a library uh, for people to use to do it on their own. We're not going to automate it. But now you'd be talking about, like, what's that API going to look like? What's the signatures going to be? Same thing is going to happen. Hopefully, you're going to create more than one idea. Then you're going to try to pick the best. You're going to use the same techniques to decide, right, criteria. The other thing that's new here and different is before with approach, we wanted to know in detail what are the user's intentions. Now we get to talk about, right, as we make implementation decisions, we can go back to that use cases sheet and say, this is how they will do they will accomplish their attention given the solution that we're intending to make and the implementation decisions we're choosing right now. Right, so what do you got? You have the use cases and you have this DM. You're gonna have more DMs, right? These can be very light 15 minute exercises. We need to make this choice. Uh, you know, we need to do something here. What are our choices? Boom, what's the trade offs of these things? This, that, or the other. It can be very lightweight. Well, I'm not talking about, you know, suffering over every decision. I'm talking about just trying to be considered as often as you can. This is when you may do diagramming. Uh, you're certainly gonna, as an outcome of doing these DMs, you're gonna make implementation decisions. You're gonna go back to that part of the story, which is the approach, and which has the direction in it right now, and you're gonna add the details. Right, if you, I don't know if you remember back to the other thing, but we said, like, what are we gonna do about this problem? We're gonna have these three APIs, right? Uh, and you, you're going to be able to do this. And then you're going to go back to your use cases and fill in the how column. It's certainly possible that in doing, I talked about this before, in doing the uh, implementation details, you may actually need to go back and alter your scope. We, we thought we were going to do this, and we didn't find a way to implement it that wasn't going to be uh, too much work or too possibly risky in, in altering code that we already had, and we don't want to take on the risk of of that much change, and then you're going to back up. All right, this is a real implementation DM for something we did already ship, right, which is the, you know, we had this problem, right? Newcomers to Clojure uh, don't know Java. They don't know there's a Java math thing, and they don't know how to do, you know, cosine. And, you know, it's just this hurdle for people. Uh, but there's a lot of different things you could do about it, right? You could do nothing and say, all right, well, We'll, we'll give you a better way to find the Java doc. Uh, so we have these characteristics, the same thing, right? We could do static imports. We could have a program that gens the thing from uh, the Java, which is what we ended up doing. Or we could hand code, and we were looking at these trade-offs. So that's how we do that. Diagrams are out of scope. Again, I could talk for an hour about this, but this is when you, you want to use this when pros and tables are inadequate. A lot of times when you're talking about flow, relationships between things, you know, visual representations are super important. Uh, so you want to do that. The one tip I would give you here is, this is not just about diagramming what you're going to do. You should diagram what's wrong, right? If you don't know how things are going to flow. If you have this problem of, you know, I only know this here and in our intention, it, we need to know it over there. Well, draw the diagram that shows you know, I have a question mark about how this gets over there, because uh, we presume that this knowledge would be here or would be in this database, and we haven't decided yet how it gets there. So diagramming your problem before you diagram your solution is, is a good technique. And finally, finally, you've done all this design. You've got this top-level story that has what is wrong, what if people, you know, what's the context, what is actually the cause, what's the strategy you're going to take, what are the details of the implementation choices you're going to make? You know why you're doing things. You know how you're going to build it. You should have a very high confidence that what you're going to build is going to work. You have a ton of supportive material, right? This will help you do it when you're trying to do it. You don't have to remember. You have to look at the work you did before. If you need to grow the team or hand it off to someone else, you have a lot of stuff to give them. And then the contention I will make in this talk is that I believe very strongly that if you take this kind of rigorous approach to doing design, the thing you will make in the end will be smaller and more general. Uh, you know, a lot of times people are like, you know, 
but we like this about closure. We like this about that about closure. And it comes from this kind of a thing, right? It's just like you keep cutting it down and cutting it across and you end up with small things that are more composable and more general um, due to having done the design. So obviously there's a million talks about how to do dev. I think people have strategies for CI or whatever. This is not that talk. Um, the one tip I would give you is don't build something on the same day you think of it. Why not? You haven't slept on it. I promise you, if you do this kind of work during the day and you start coding in the afternoon, the next morning you'll be like, that, no, that, we shouldn't have done that. <laughs> so just don't even bother. You know, go out for coffee or you know, uh, talk about something else, uh, but give it a day. All right, so thanks. I want to thank especially Dan. He's not here, but he's been tracking me doing a lot of mentorship of design and taking a lot of notes, which really helped me uh, build this talk. And you know, Stu and Alex and all the people I work with on the Closure and Datomic teams. Uh, you know, we do this, I think it's hard to do, and I think it's hard to uh, learn, but I think you can do it, you can learn it, and uh, with practice, uh, you can accomplish things. So thank you very much. <laughs>